All right, so my name is Weston Ricks, and this is my senior project, Quickship. So to start off, a little bit of background around myself. I went to the Logan School for Creative Learning for middle school, and as some of you may know, it's similar to Challenge. And you know Challenge, it's sort of like the accelerated uh, academic school there. And there's pretty small classes. My graduating class size was 32 eighth graders, and I had two units of study there because there's such a small class size. We don't have like normal classes there. We would uh, study two things per year, which leads me to this. Um, I studied a lot of engineering things, ranging from aerodynamics to like ancient Roman engineering to like the engineering of the Navy ships. So I've always been interested in engineering, and I took this to um, Grandview, where, as you can see, I've taken many uh, tech classes, ranging from programming to architecture to SolidWorks. So. These two passions, engineering and SOLIDWORKS, led me to my initial ideas. At first, I wanted to make like a complete model of a drivetrain in SOLIDWORKS. And a drivetrain, it's everything in your car, from like the engine, the transmission, uh, you know, all the way back to the wheels. Because at the time, I was disassembling my friend's car with him and swapping out like everything in it. So I was really interested in that. But I didn't do that idea because it would be too cat heavy for remote learning. So my next idea, which is the one that I'm presenting about today, um, was I wanted to make a product for customizing cars. Because I'm a car enthusiast, my friends are all car enthusiasts, I wanted to make a product that could you know, fit the needs of that. And this was great because it would use SOLIDWORKS, but there are also many different ways to approach this. Um, being it like, you know, people want to customize their wheels, or their shift knobs, or the color of their cars. So there's all, all sorts of things to do with this. So the purpose of my project was to enable more customization for car enthusiasts. You know, so I chose to do custom shift knobs, because a lot of different people have shift knobs, whether it's like an eight ball shift knob, or it looks like a samurai sword, or a whole lot of different things like that. Um, and the shift knob, as you know, for a lot of people have stick shifts, it's the thing that you shift to it, not into like, you know, park and drive, but one, two, three, four, and reverse. And what I wanted to do was, instead of just, because a lot of people have shift knobs that they change out, but I wanted to offer availability to like switch them out quickly. You know, so if some guy in a Miata was going to a track day, he needed something that's ergonomic that he can shift quickly with, but then if he's going to a car show, he wants something that looks cool, like a samurai sword to go with the rest of his paint job and everything. And I wanted to fill that gap um, to provide a product to do that. So my objectives, I wanted to design a mechanism that would release quickly, because People can change out their own shift knobs, but it takes time, and I wanted it to be able to be like a quick under five second process. I wanted to learn about material science and like the production of it and production science. Um, and then I wanted to troubleshoot and make improvements on a real product, because I was going to actually make it using the CNC machine and all sorts of stuff like that. And then I wanted to troubleshoot it to make it actually functional. <clears throat> and then here I greatly overestimated myself. I wanted to patent it. But that didn't happen because I didn't have an actual product down here. And I wanted to keep to my timeline and stay timely and keep in contact with my advisors. My outcomes, I did in fact design a fast working release mechanism. Um, I, I did learn about injection molding for material science. But with these two, I did not produce an actual product that I can patent or troubleshoot. And then also pitfalls that I will discuss in later slides led me to not sticking to my timeline. So for my advisors for this project, uh, my expert advisor was Christian Mark. He took this class last year. He was very interested in cars, and he was very interested in engineering. So he's like me, except a year older and a year experience, so I thought he would be a perfect advisor for this project. And then my support advisors were my grandfather, and he started many businesses, so he's very administrative, so I thought he could help me stick to my timeline. And then my other support, was, my other support advisors were old friends that I am no longer friends with. <laughs> so, they're not here. So, for my website, I used, as many of you used, Weebly. And I used it because uh, Mr. Combs gave us some samples of other senior project websites uh, that used Weebly, and they looked great, and it was free and easy, so I was just going to go with that. Um, and then I wanted to go for a clean and modern feel, and I wanted to use quotes to, like, sort of exemplify my product. Um, if you go on my website, quickshift.wr.weebly.com, uh, you can see some of those. And I just wanted minimal clutter and have it look nice and modern. There were some hiccups, though. As you can see here, it took me a week to figure out how to format this image because I was using a template, and it didn't want an image to be that wide to be in that spot. 
so for my logo, I outsourced it to the art students upstairs because I don't do art, um, and I wanted, whoops, I wanted it to look like to pop out, and I wanted it to look fast because the idea of my project is that you could quickly and fast change between shift knobs. So I came up with this idea of this like arrow running from the Q to the S that you know evokes ideas of speed when you look at the logo. And then it also pops because it's black on red, and there's this sort of offset behind the text that helps it pop. So here's my initial timeline. I apologize for it being small. Um, but you don't need to read it because basically from the get-go, I um, went off of my timeline because I overestimated myself. I thought it would take two months to create a working uh, release mechanism. But in that time period, I was able to make some prototypes, but none of them actually worked. I will discuss those pitfalls and how they didn't work in later slides. But, so this is my updated timeline, which I included the research and how the time that took uh, for me to actually create those prototypes. And then I included uh, my changes to my timeline about what I was actually doing during those times of life. And I created this uh, when we were going back to in-person school, so I also had these goals on that timeline. So early progress. I was beginning research on how similar quick release system works and then how similar products work because I haven't gotten the product. So um, quick lock steering wheels, they're um, for mainly in race cars, so because they don't have open doors, you can get in and out and you need to remove the steering wheel. But many car enthusiasts have them because they look cool and it's just fun to have. And they have them like you know red or like heart shaped like pink, so it's another way like my product that people can customize their car. It was perfect because they have a quick release mechanism. And I learned that um, how they work is with spring loaded devices like plungers and pins, like this. Here's an example of one. Basically, how it works is this is almost like a bolt that just threads into a hole, and then it has a properly calibrated spring where um, an object coming on the other side of this would have an indent that this would fit into, which would keep it in place until a certain amount of force is applied to remove it. And my first major design centered around this, and I drew out my ideas on paper, and it, my first design worked, but because these are like rather large devices, they're very small, but large where you know something ergonomic the size of a shift knob that wouldn't weigh you down while you're shifting, um, it was just too large for that to make it work uh, on such a small scale, so this, I ditched this design, which led me to my second major design, where it's, Kind of hard to explain because I deleted the SOLIDWORKS files because I got frustrated. But it used a spring pin, which is similar to a spring loaded device, except instead of it going out, the springs go to the side where they apply force. And I used that in here with two separate sleeves that would keep it in place. But the pitfall was this is I forgot that there's a shift bolt that comes up out of your transmission from your car that would have an interference with the cross piece here. Um, and because of that interference, my lesson learned was to make it in SOLIDWORKS with the complete assembly of all parts so I can see where their interference is once I attach it all mates. So my third and fourth major design, I this was starting in January or December. Um, I intentionally wouldn't do anything going on the interior because I learned my lesson from the last piece about not having any interferences. So I had a large external spring that would actuate a different lock that you could push down and then twist, and then it would come back up. Again, I don't have the SOLIDWORKS files for these. But um, basically, it was a large external spring, but with a thin uh, diameter. So it would denature, because it wouldn't have enough force to actually apply when you shift. Because it could hold it in place, but when you shift, you're not you know, touching it with a feather. You're uh, enthusiastically driving. So this design then failed. So this leads me to my pitfalls, pitfalls of COVID and remote learning, which I'm sure none of you are aware of. And then I had repeated prototype failure, which I just discussed. So the pitfalls with COVID is I would see this screen for you know half an hour on end using remote desktop here um, to load up into SolidWorks, and I would just you know click extrude, and it would take two minutes to understand that I clicked. So um, that really caused me to have a slow working speed where something I could get done in 20 minutes might take me two hours. Um, and during that time, I would have killed just to have access to one of these computers. And then the pitfalls for prototype failure, as I just discussed, each failure design, and then I would find a new one, get excited about it, 
and then it would fail. So this got disheartening after many fails, but I regret not being more tenacious. <laughs> so I had project reignition when we were going back to in-person school because you know that meant having fast solid works, that meant having more contact time with peers and Mr. Combs. And then I also had a new idea for my mechanism that I knew would work. So a little background on that idea. I got it from my grandfather. Well, I got it from my father, but my grandfather's dead, but it was about him. So with my grandfather, he was an inventor and an engineer. And he actually invented the first closed spinner fishing reel, but sold the patent to Zedco before it got big. So there's been a history of inventor and engineers in my family. And he also worked on World War II naval guns, which are pictured here. This is a breach of one of those, and these have interrupted threads. So this idea leads me to how I can incorporate that into my project with interrupted threads. So this is pictures of my product on solvers. Here, this is the inner threads, which would um, mate with these outer threads, because these are like a key that fit into this keyway here, and it just slides down and twists and locks down. It doesn't like rotate the whole way, it just slides and twists, and this is a strong and stable mechanism of fastening two parts together and then just unfastening them quickly. So again, I talked about before, this is the shift bolt that extends up out of your transmission into your car, which I have pictured in a smaller solid works marble here, and this is a section of you with an eight ball shift knob on it. And the idea was, is like I finally had an idea that worked. What the idea was is the product would be a one-time initial setup of the user screwing down this inner thread piece onto their shift knob and screwing it down tight. And then there would be different knobs attached to different outer threads. And this is a press fit here. These are two separate pieces, but it would come from the factory with that tight press fit that couldn't be undone. So I would just sell separate modules of these with different shift knobs. And it would just, again, like I said before, slide down and twist, and then you would have you know, your eight ball shifter or your samurai sword, or some people have like a hammer, or all sorts of things. <laughs> and this was great because it was easy, quick, and secure, which met all my goals for this project. So then these are the separate shift knobs that I was able to create in SOLIDWORKS. This is sort of clear plastic diamond. This is a design of a shift knob I have on my car currently. And then this is an eight ball. So that was, you know, I was able to finish my design for quick shift. And then I was thinking, okay, I still have time left because I now have access to SOLIDWORKS. So I was able to finish this very quickly. I was thinking about how I could create these, like if I were to actually create, you know, a product myself, which leads me to, or, oh, so the design, sorry, a little ahead of myself. So the design process, I was using SOLIDWORKS, obviously, and I uh, used equations in all of my pieces. So if I needed to re-diameter something because there would be a different shift bolt diameter, then I could just go in and update one equation, and it would update it all across the board. And then I also learned, had to learn how to use a thread feature with interrupted threads, and I was able to use SOLIDWORKS CAD CAM Tutorial, which is a great SOLIDWORKS website, or YouTube channel, I mean, which um, I was able to learn that very quickly and efficiently. So the design process for this, uh, the hiccups were able to get these keyways fitting properly with enough tolerance for the outer keyways to fit together. Other than that, it's just a simple cylinder with threads. And then the design process for this, I wanted there to be, rather than just a smooth surface on the outside that the user couldn't tighten down quickly, this, it's not shown very well, but it's sort of a, I'm not sure how to des uh, describe the shape, but there's like outer edges on it that you can grip and really tighten out to make sure that it won't come loose. Um, but other than that, again, it's just sort of a cylinder with threads on it. Cylinder with threads on it. And then this is the final assembly, and the hiccups were just thread mates because they were very finicky, and you needed to know the order of how to make the threads, and I did not. So then, this leads me to my new phase, which I got ahead of myself before and was talking about. I was thinking about how I could make those shift knobs if I were to actually make a product. And so I was learning about plastic injection molding. This is ABS plastic pellets, as you can see here. And then with that, I wanted to create my own in SOLIDWORKS as if I were to create one in real life. And I wanted to learn about the history and innovations and invention of injection molding because almost every plastic piece that you touch today was created by that. It's something so large and relevant in our life I wanted to learn more about. So it was replaced, invented to replace ivory for pool balls. Because one elephant 
back in 1872 when they were using ivory could make about eight to ten pool balls. So with it being the most popular sport at that time, you can imagine how many elements were being poached. So this pool company um, put out, not a bounty, but um, I don't know what the word is, uh, for a replacement for ivory for pool balls, and John Wesley Hyatt came up with plastic injection molding. He ended up not selling the invention to this company because they did not have the right bounce, like similar to ivory, and if you've ever played pool, you know it's very key on how the bounce is with the pool balls. But this is an example of what the first plastic injection molded object was. So then innovations with injection molding is Lego. All of you guys have touched Lego pieces and you know that they're plastic, and, but what you didn't know is that they can survive, I think, the weight of a smart car in one single Lego brick. That's why if you step on one, your foot's always going to hurt. <laughs> so, but they're also an innovator in how they can create um, plastic injection molded pieces as their tolerance, for, I think it's almost one in like 750,000 is an error piece. Um, and they're also very efficient and precise with their injection molding. So I learned a lot about that and more information, more detailed information is in my journals on their website. So, of an injection molding machine, which is pictured here, this is my creation of SolidWorks, there are three main components. Right here is the melting housing, right here is the clamp, and in here is the clamp actually. So for the melting housing, first plastic colored pieces get fed in through this funnel into here, but then they get fed through here and this auger screw rotates and brings them forward through these heating bands, which even they heat them. And so the first plastic injection molding machine didn't actually have this, there was just molten, there was just plastic in here, but it would heat unevenly because the inside didn't get heat from the outside, so the outside would burn and the inside would still be um, unmelted plastic. So the screw helps mitigate that. So then after this area is filled with molten plastic, this screw rams forward and pushes it into the mold, which is over here, which I'll show in a moment. But if you've noticed, there's this green check right here. And what this does is, if this piece just moved forward, then all the plastic would get pushed back the screw, like back behind the screw. So this green ring gets pushed forward and locks back against this, so it basically creates a seal so no plastic can move back. It'll all get pushed into the mold because it needs to get pushed through at a high pressure to fill all the various different cavities and runners and whatnot. So then what I was talking about here is the mold. This is a mold for an eight ball shift knob. And it's a pretty simple one because it's just a circle, but there are other ones that have like runners because you know plastic forks, those are made injection molding and they're made almost 12 at a time. But this is a pretty simple mold. But what's interesting about um, plastic injection molding is the where they, the two molds meet, it can never be even. It has to be offset even by a little bit and those edges also have to be rounded. Otherwise there's too much of a vacuum and the mold cannot separate. So, this is um, a picture of the mold opening, as you can see, this orange piece which fits in this um, blue piece, which is fixed to the other half of the mold, opens up, and this would be actuated by pneumatic air pressure, creating a negative vacuum, pulling the orange piece, and thus the other half of the mold back. And then here's the ejector. If you can see over here, the ejector piece, which is this gray piece, is all the way up here. As it goes back, it bumps into the blue piece, which then pushes it forward, thus pushing out the mold, the piece from the mold. And so on all plastic pieces, there are witness marks from other injectors pushing them out. And I didn't want witness marks on any of my shift knob, so I was hiding it in the H pattern of a shift knob. The H pattern is where it says one, two, three, four. Because otherwise, if you look at a piece of plastic, there's like small little divots of where it was ejected from the mold. But I was able to hide it and have no other witness marks aside from what I was actually needing to have with the mold piece. So then here's the clamp actuator, which again, I talked about is, is uh, actuated with pneumatic air pressure, not shown in the piece here because that is difficult to create in SOLIDWORKS. Um, but the design process, for that, and then this is just the clamp, which is a clamp that doesn't move, it holds things. So the design process, I again used equations with my SOLIDWORKS because I, if I needed to you know, change the diameter of the melting housing to create the proper amount of volume of plastic to fill the molds, I could just do it with an equation and you know, update across all assemblies and all parts of drawings. And then what I used was sort of a master sketch. I don't know the proper term for this, but what I did is SOLIDWORKS, I created a sketch 
of, uh, through the midplane of all different parts, you know, the table, the mold, the clamp, the actuator, the ejector, melting housing, everything. And off that, I can make either midplane extrusions or revolves around different center lines. So that way, if I want them to, to change dimensions of all pieces, I could just do it in one part, and then it would update across everything else. That way, I wouldn't have to go through every single different part. This was a tedious though because I had to create every part in an assembly, which was a little slow, but it worked. And I was able to you know, see the live parts being created around the other parts. So for the melting housing, again, this was just sort of a revolve. Um, and I occasionally had to change the diameter of this from what I initially started because there has to be pressure in the injection molding to fill the volume of the mold. And this is where it gets injected into the mold at the tip of this. And then here, the one that was this was creating the, the fins on this screw because I couldn't use a thread feature because these are way too big for that. I had to learn how to use a drafting feature. Um, but again, I just watched SolidWorks CAD CAM tutorial and it taught me how to do it nicely and easily. And then this is just the revolve, again, the revolve. And this one, I was way overthinking. I was trying to use this making a shell piece, but then I remembered and just revolve it with the right plane. And here, the mold, again, um, I talked about how these edges could not match up, and then also I made the mold completely, and then I had to cut a hole with the ejector piece in the back of this mold to make it eject, and that was also difficult because I didn't know that there was a cavity feature on SolidWorks, so I was trying just to mirror it in an assembly, and then I learned about the cavity feature, which just made, you know, two hours worth of work in five seconds. So that was a little bit of a pickup, and then here with the ejector, I just had to mirror it off the rounded edge of the eight ball shifter onto a flat surface, which was difficult, but I used a uh, convert component or mm -hmm. convert components and it worked and I was able to extrude that. And then this is at a right angle because I made it an assembly first and got some of that. Again, just to revolve, to revolve. And then this is a final section view so you can see all the different parts that I was talking about, you know, plastic coming in, getting melted, ramming forward into the mold being ejected, and then the piece drops through this hole onto a conveyor belt below, and then it closes and it's ready to create another piece. So, with both my quick shift, shift knob done, and learned about material science and production science, I would, I, I was, you know, finished with the project. But the next steps I would take would be more development in SOLIDWORKS with like testing and real tolerance interference, and then I would make physical prototypes that I could actually try and work with. But I cannot do that, but if I could, I would do that over the summer. So reflection on my project, I could uh, greatly improve on being timely, you know, sticking to my timeline, not deviating from it in the first month. Um, and I could have been more persistent, because with SolidWorks taking so long with remote desktop at home, so I have two different monitors, I could have SolidWorks on one, wait for it to load, and just, you know, review AP site notes on the other, and just go back and forth like that, rather than just giving up. Um, and I could have been more consistent. At the start of the year and at the end of the year, I accomplished a lot. If I could have carried that throughout the whole year, I would have a lot to show for it. But what I did do well on was pulling it together at the end of the year and having a fair amount of stuff to show for it. And I do have respect for my work and I'm proud of what I have to show to you here today. And I do know my mistakes with such as being timely and being more consistent. But what I will take with me is the skills I learned. I'm going to CU Boulder Leeds School of Business, and I will keep, you know, this will be in the back of my head every time I procrastinate to not procrastinate, to keep on uh, my timeline with all the projects, because with, you know, a Leeds School of Business, there's a lot of different projects that I will have the opportunity to undertake. Here are my sources, my second source pages. Thank you for listening. Any questions? That's right. right. So you said that you want to be one into this going with the idea of you want to give people the ability to make like customizable like uh, like knobs and whatnot. But having like a mold seems like you just want to reproduce it. So how would you go about having someone do a custom one? Right. So on my website, again, I didn't include this in my next steps, but I'm ready to talk about it. So on my website, I would have the ability to submit with um, uh, RT, not RTCAD. Uh, it's an online CAD thing that you know, is escaping me right now, but where you can submit a design for a shift knob, I would make the mold for that, and then create it, and put it on the device, and then send it to the user so they can have all different types of knobs. So you showed a bunch of like closed objects, and so how are like 
hollow objects made, like for example, like a water bottle or something? Yeah, so with that, you know, there's it's hollow, there's nothing in it. So what they do is actually, instead of injecting it into a mold, what they do is they have sort of like a balloon extend down, and then they have two things clamp on it, and there's an opening that fills it with air pressure, and different pressures can create different thickness walls of uh, the plastic in that mold. And then after it's cooled, the clamp opens up, and you know, things like gas cans or water bottles or anything like that, that's how it's made. Anything else? Yes. Awesome. All right, good job. Thank you. Thank you.